Today I'm here in Richmond on Thames for a brand new around the ground. This area is mainly known for rugby. Here behind me is Twickenham Stadium, the home of the England rugby team and the largest dedicated rugby venue in the world. However, I'm going to be visiting their football team, Hampton and Richmond Borough FC, as they take on St Albans City FC in the National League South. As always, I'll be exploring their ground, taking a look through this club's 101 year history and attending a Q&A with the manager and chairman. Formerly known as Hampton FC, the club were formed in 1921 and are nicknamed the Beavers. The team currently compete in the National League South and have been doing so since 2016. And speaking of 2016, that same year, the club took part in one of the longest ever penalty shootouts with Cockfosters FC. An amazing 42, yes you heard that right, 42 penalties were taken. The club play their football here at the Clio Sol Beverly Stadium, which is called that because of a recent competition where the winner would choose a new name for the ground, a fan named Jimmy Saw won and Clio's his daughter. The ground is also known as the Beverly or the Bev for short, and was opened in 1959. It can fit three and a half thousand people in, 644 of whom can sit down. This number was hit when the club took on Hayes and Yedding United in 2009, in a game which saw the visitors win 3-2. At the back of this stand is all of the club's crests from throughout their time, which is a really nice touch. This season, the club are celebrating their centenary season and they're now looking forward to the future by raising funds to replace their floodlights, which are near the end of their life, as described by the chairman. And they're now also going to be getting a new artificial pitch in to replace the grass one here, which has faced several flooding problems. We then took a look inside of the club shop. In there was lots of match worn shirts for £25 each, which I thought was a good price. Some retro shirts and training shirts for about a similar price. Some programmes from previous games and much, much more. After that, it was time to get a drink and a burger. Okay, so as always, we've got some food. We've got two portions of chips here. They come in bags, which is quite nice. And a burger each. And this looks like probably the best burger I've ever had at a football match. Toasted buns, uh, sloppy onions, ketchup. We've got bacon under there as well. A really nice juicy patty and two melted American cheeses. How's it? Mmm. That looks so good. Right, I'm going to tuck in. It's very meaty, but honestly everything about it is perfect. The opposition this Easter Monday, as I already said, is St Albans City FC, a team I've already visited this season. Last time these two teams met, the Saints came out on top, winning 3-0 here at Clarence Park. However, the teams are now only a few points apart from each other, making this clash a really interesting one. Eventually, the teams made their way out onto the pitch. And after a problem with the sprinklers, we were off. Right from the kickoff, the St Albans players were running rings around the Hampton defenders, however, failed to convert any chances. Hampton corner was then flung into the box, which started a game of volleyball. Up the other end of the pitch, Joe Neal thinks he's taking a rugby free kick. 
In response, David Fisher hits a low driven shot on Michael Johnson, the city number one, who manages to save it. And that was all the first 45 minutes had to offer. After a speedy 15 minute break, everyone returned back to their seats. And for this half, I would be down with the St Albans fans, and my dad would be up the other end of the pitch with the Beavers fans. The cross was whipped in, but it was headed away by a Beavers defender, and that seemed to be the story of the second half. Several times throughout the game, Hampton kept on doing these long throws into the box. However, they never led to anything. In the 73rd minute, one of the best chances of the game by far fell to Irman Uche who unfortunately hit the ball just a little too lightly to get past Michael Johnson. During a huge chunk of pressure from the Saints, Zane Banton ran down the wing, put the ball into the box, however, it was cleared comfortably. And that was full time, a 0-0 draw. Join me now in the clubhouse for a Q&A with manager Gary McCann and chairman Jack Slabars. Gary, obviously at the beginning of this centenary season we had some uh, high ambitions. How do you feel now, sat a lot further on, after, after you know, the way the season has panned out? Disappointed, set, I would say, to where we felt we were in the summer. Um, you know, when you start off um, putting together a team, uh, recruitment's key, it always is. Um, we felt we'd recruited a squad of players that was capable of competing in this division and muscling in on the play playoffs and challenging maybe higher than that. But uh, like with anything, it's um, there's a lot of factors to be successful. There's them same factors. You know, there for you know, to be unsuccessful. And you know, I look at where we was at. I think uh, the dynamics of the group didn't quite feel right. I felt that five or ten minutes in, five or ten games into the season, I looked at the form of some of the players that have been around me for you know, a period of time that had dropped off, um, and that was another factor. Um, and and also, you, you know, you look at certain players that have been in and around you for their coming into the full season for some of them. I just felt they, they looked they lacked a bit of motivation as well. Um, and I look at that and as soon as that is evident to me, I feel like I've got to come down on it. Um, commitment levels also need to be there and continuous. And you know, some of our decisions were made on them and on them those decisions as well where commitment dropped off. But but those four things together that I've just mentioned and, and it you know results in maybe a, an indifferent season. Um, health and form being two of the, two, two of the main reasons for me because I did feel we had a group. But we've had lot, lots of obstacles, lots of challenges. Um, that's been well documented over the course of the season. We're not on our own. I don't come up on, you know, it'd be on Twitter or be whatever it be that we put it out on our socials. You never see me complaining. I'm just stating facts. We have had challenges. We have had problems. And, it's resulted in maybe the season not being as, as you know as, as successful as we hoped for it to be, but that is football. I mean, there's many teams, that, you know, over the course of this season that, that have struggled that maybe felt they wouldn't, and, and we was one of them. We've done the best we possibly can. We've had to make adjustments and changes throughout the season, um, and we're still feeling the after effects really of that now. Because you look at our side, and no one can question the commitment and effort and work rate that they put in. I think that's been there from the start. It's something that us as a management team demand, but we've lacked a little bit of quality at certain times and there's no question that you know, we've, um, we've maybe not replaced 
one or two players that needed to replace the same quality. But never easy, never easy at, at, you know, when we find ourselves. We've not got our unlimited finances and we have to make them adjustments accordingly in, in, in terms of recruitment. And you know, we've come up a little bit shy this year, but it's not for the want of a lack of effort or, or trying. It's, uh, it's just been pretty short in a relentless league. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's fair enough, but I've spoken to you a number of you know, opportunities over the course of the season. You, you've said, you know, you've been involved in the game of football for a long time. You've mm. said that the circumstances that presented themselves over a certain period of months was the hardest you know, yeah. time of your yeah. career. Why, why, would, why did you say that? Well, I think that the, the challenges that the people, you know, are quite you know, well, well related. I mean, the COVID issues over December were, were a problem for us. I mean, we had one training session in December, um, or in a three, three and a half week period because of different COVID issues, and that resulted in us losing a bit of momentum um, and a bit of fitness, a bit of sharpness. Um, we wasn't on, on our own in that sense. I know other teams suffered as well, but over that period, which was a crucial period for us, I see a bit of frustration starting to, to grow in the group. Uh, for different reasons, and it was to do with performance. Um, that resulted obviously in a couple of incidents that happened that we had to deal with, um, that again was uh, well documented, but um, there has been, I mean, look, health this season, we've had a lot of key members out on the side at you know key moments in the side, in the, in the season. Um, a lot of, um, a lot of niggles, a lot of knocks, a couple of long-term injuries to key members. We've had to use and, and the loan market, which is not something I'm a big advocate of, and I've, I've said that in, in recent seasons. But this year, it see us needing to, to, to go down that route, and uh, you know, a couple of two or three of the loanies that we've had in have done extremely well. Uh, well and, and with that in mind, Jack, as chairman of the football club in its centenary season, how have you seen just on the pitch? Um, well, on the pitch, I think Gary summed it up quite nicely there. We, you know, we sat down at the end of last season and talked about who we wanted to retain and keep the spine of the, of the team, that, you know, the core running through, which we did. And um, I think we all thought, um, the management team certainly, and, and myself and uh, the board thought that we, you know, we, we had a very good starting squad compared to previous seasons where we've had little or no squad when we started. So it was important to have that core there, which we did have, we've added to it. Um, it's easy to make all the excuses in the world. You know, football's football. You, you're going to have health issues. You're going to have problems with players. Um, I think what hurts us most was that all seemed to come at the same time in a perfect storm in the night between. Um, thanks, Alistair. Ruining my train of thought. You know, all those all those issues seem to all come at the same time. And when it hits you that like that, um, it's very hard to to bounce back quickly and I think that's what we saw, you know, having to lose some of the, the playing squad for various reasons. I think some of those were if you were there were pretty evident why they you know, they had the decisions had to be made. Um, and when there's some of your better players who are who are leaving you, it's gonna hurt you. Right, this is not on the pitch. I don't want to get into the whole artificial pitch thing. Yeah. You mentioned the centenary. Yeah. And it's not a criticism, I understand why. But it hasn't been a centenary season. No, it hasn't. But I mean, as I said, you know, it, we, we've been in the back to back by COVID, so it's been hard to get any momentum going for that team. It really has. It's, it's been very disappointing as the other people like it. You know, really I mean, but it wouldn't have been hard to put a flag on the platform. Maybe. Well, I, I don't know what happened to the flags. Someone was supposed to be getting the flags. You know, no. I mean, they, 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 there have been misses. There's no doubt. Mm. Um, I think maybe we have to have a, a 101. <laughs> Gary, just out of just out of interest. As a manager who's um, you know been involved in non-league non football for a long time, and also had a team on a on a 3G, 4G pitch, whatever you want to call it, what what are your thoughts on the potential of Hampton Richmond well, Borough being a 3G pitch? I think from a football perspective, I think it's um, it's the way forward. Um, I know there's, a, there's some some gripes obviously about going 3G, but you know we I, I use Hendon as an example. I was there. I mean. I spent seven or eight years at Hendon on the floor in terms of finances, um, working with next to nothing. If you look at where Hendon are now, in, the, in a three or four year cycle since they've installed the 3G in at SJP, they've now got one of the, the I wouldn't say the best.
better budgets in that league, but they're able to, to give Lee, who's a good friend of mine, a, a much better uh, budget than what I had to work with for a long time. And, and that is as much to do with the 3G as it is to do with anything. Um, there's a sustainable income that comes from the pitch. Um, you're able to bring the whole community within the football club to the pitch. Um, the, the, the money that's laid out for training facilities, I know Jackson Ben will share with you that that's quite a big layout on a, on a season to season basis, that will stop. But we'll also as a first team and an academy and everything else, we'll be able to have this as a, as a base to work from. Uh, Jax, I'm just going to ask you know, straight off, what is the comparative cost of having that pitch out there and then us having a 4G, 3G pitch out Well. <coughs> Cost-wise, Gal's already alluded to, and there's a number of factors. So, for starters, you know, Richard does a fantastic job out there, but it, it doesn't, it's not free. It costs a lot of money to maintain the pitch out there. We have to do renovation works through the summer. You know, we're probably looking around, I would say, 25 to 30,000 pounds on that pitch just to maintain it for the season. Um, we've then got the cost of the first team training at Bedford. We've got the cost of the academy boys playing elsewhere. Villa at Rangers, you're looking at around another £20,000 there. So you're already looking at fifty grand just before you've even started kicking the football. Um, we obviously, those costs would, would not disappear completely. There's still, there's still <coughs> costs associated with maintaining a, a 3G pitch. You know, it has to be brushed, it has to be, brushed, it has to be pelleted, it has to be uh, leafed, it has to be removed. And so, but, you know, in comparison to, to what it costs to maintain that grass pitch, especially, fortunately, that specific pitch because of the drainage issues that there are, I think most people are aware of the drainage issues on the first and last side. Certainly those of you who had to go out there and, and, and fork it at half-time or after the game, then, you know, you've done some difference, you know how quickly it cuts up. Uh, you know, that is as good as it, that's as good as that pitch is ever been. But it's never going to get better than this can be. So, the cost savings immediately are they're probably you know thirty to forty thousand pounds just by putting the artificial pitch. Um, yeah, that, that yeah. covers that question, doesn't it? That does cover that question. So there will be there will people be sat here now saying, okay, so how much is that this new pitch going to cost us, and how will that be funded? Okay, so unfortunately the first one is you can't get. We've we've got the floodlights, which are we can go onto the floodlights. I'll just just go off at a the floodlights are more of a, a necessity than the pitch. Those floodlight ones were put in, I think, in 1966. Um, they've been replaced by maps and everything put in since then, but they were end of life probably about 20 years ago. Um, and if anyone walks past the buzzing one down there, you're probably thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll be end of life if I'm near it for too long. Um, it's, you know, that is a necessity rather than a nice to have. The floodlights are, uh, we, can, we can get. 70% up to 70% of funding from the FSIF, which is the Football Stadium Improvement Fund. That's obviously a massive fill up for us because it means that a huge amount of that cost is offset. Fortunately, for a pitch, you can't get the, the foundation funding, you can't, you can't get the grants for it. So it means that we would have to privately fund it. Um, the likelihood is that will be through a bank loan. We've already inquired with that, that's obviously part of the work that we do prior to, to, to putting the planning in, etc. Uh, we're looking at probably around half a million pounds to put the pitch in, um, realistically. So, you know, it's a substantial, substantial investment. Um, but it's an investment that, working on the business model we've looked at and talked about the savings we've already seen, you know, it's one that really is, we, we have to make it. We have to, if we want to move the club forward and make it sustainable, which has always been my, my mission statement is to make this club sustainable because, you know, we, we are having a shortfall every season, it's quite a substantial one if you want to be challenging on the pitch, if you want to be improving that challenge and looking towards moving up the leagues, then we have to ensure that we have the revenue streams available and minimise our, our, our costs as much as possible. Um, just a quick question in terms of uh, for Gary really, obviously with the changes to the pitch and also that, I would like to ask a bit more about the first team, as of where would you like to see this team in the long term in terms of well, where you want to compete next season and how you guys want to play? I think there'll be an overhaul in the summer. Um, obviously, recruitment will differ. I mean, I think Jackson's just made the point 
um, what 3G surface entails. Um, certain players are not able to play on 3G. Certain players that we've had in our squad over the last couple of years have struggled to train at Bedford um, on a week-to-week -week basis. So your recruitment does change. So obviously we're we're planning the best we possibly can with next year in mind. But looking at the current squad and looking at where we're at, um, I think there'll be a uh, there'll, there'll be a change in personnel. Um, I think we've gone through that three-stroke, four-year cycle, uh, as I alluded to at the start of the, the, the conversations. Um, that, you know, you tend to, to players just get a little bit demo, demotivated. Um, I think there needs to be some changes. Um, I, I would sit here and say, if you used to really, really call me, how many of the current squad would be in and around what we're looking to do next year? only be at about 40 percent so i think that tells you there's going to be some changes i haven't been um, as happy as as, as as i would like to be with with the current group even now as i sit here with what we've assembled and how much better we've done in recent weeks i want us to be better i want you know especially at home especially in front of our own fans i want to be a little bit more pleasing on the eye if you look at my teams in the past, that's been very much our remit. We have an identity. And I'd like us to be, a, a, you know, a bit more pleasing on the eye for sure, and a bit more successful. So uh, that's that's the uh, remit. We have to make some changes to personnel because it's been a season uh, of challenge, um, and there will be there will be some adjustments made. Well, that's the end of yet another Around the Ground, and I really hope you have enjoyed watching. Uh, thank you so much to James Reed, the media person here at Hampton Richmond Borough, for arranging today. Uh, I really did enjoy myself, and hopefully we can see, as the chairman and manager have just spoken about, uh, Hampton Richmond Borough slowly moving up the levels, and fingers crossed into the National League very, very soon. If you did enjoy watching, please make sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.